Good morning, good afternoon, and I understand for some of our international guests, good evening. Uh, this is a webinar by Community Science on Beyond the Platitudes, Understanding and Measuring Power Building. I'm David Chavis, Senior Fellow at Community Science, and I will be walking you through this today. Our takeaways today is that it's not that complicated or confusing if you keep your eye on the prize. The background to this webinar is that over the last years going to uh, American Evaluation Association, meeting of philanthropy and others around power, they often talked about how confusing and complicated and difficult it was to be able to evaluate and to, to, to be able to uh, evaluate and research power and to define it. And what we found in our practice looking cross-culturally and across different models is that there is a very clear underlying understanding of power. And we thought it was really important to bring to the field the ability to be able to uh, measure it and be able to inform and improve strategies through our under a better understanding of what power and power building is. Um, We'll also talk about today the relationship between equity, power, and evaluation, and that you can't have greater equity in any system without having greater equity and power. We'll also want you to take away that there are indicators of having power as an outcome of power building processes. Um, we've seen across the country this movement from coalition and collaboration um, back to the roots of understanding that building power is really important for equity and that there's a pathway to building power that tells a story that is vital to our understanding as well as our evaluation and our ability to improve the quality of strategies that build power and bring about greater equity. I'd like to take this moment to introduce you to Community Science and our wonderful, talented, and committed team of award-winning research and development um, an organization that works with government foundations and nonprofits to solve these various social problems through community and other systems change with the purpose of promoting uh, equity. Um, I also want to make a plug for the fact that we are a growing organization. If you go to our website and you're interested, we have several positions open um, to be able to uh, open this opportunity to other people of like commitment. Before we go further, I just wanted to introduce uh, the rest of the panel uh, first and have them introduce themselves. Hi, yeah. good afternoon, good morning. Um, I'm Kian Lee and I'm Vice President of Consulting at Community Science. And here I've been leading community science work on doing evaluation in service of racial equity. And in doing so, issues about community engagement and power come up quite a bit, which is why um, I'm working with David and Celeste to do this webinar. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Celeste Martinez. Um, I am calling to you all from Denver, Colorado. I'm the founder and owner of Celestia Alegria, Igniting Joy Through Transformation. And through my business, I offer a variety of services, including life coaching to women of color and queer trans people of color, facilitation and racial equity training um, to both social justice and arts organizations. Um, and I'm grateful to be here for this conversation. My background before um, moving into coaching and consulting is really rooted in community organizing um, here in Colorado. Um, and so I was really excited to join this conversation with community science to just offer some insights both um, from those past experiences and also the ways that I continue to support the local ecosystem here in my state. Great. Thank you, Celeste. And again, I'm David Chavis, um, and um, I um, uh, co-lead the, I started this work in community org as a community organizer and had found the importance of, of information and power. I currently uh, lead, co-lead the equitable community development area and our effective citizenry area. My work right now look, works at, on building the, the infrastructure or the ecosystem for power building initiatives at the state and local level. Um, I also work on a number of equitable development areas. I wanted to start this um, webinar with an understanding of a book that I keep on talking about, um, a quote by Martin Luther King, where power properly understood is the ability to achieve purpose the strength required to bring about social, political, or economic changes. In this sense, power is not only desirable, but necessary in order to achieve the demands of love and justice. 
And when Martin Luther King Jr. talks about love, he's talking about community and that beloved community. And that is the theme here. So as we begin to think about what does power really mean, um, this is an important, I think, leveling um, quote to begin our discussion with. I'd also like to encourage people to look at the book because if we don't learn about history, we are destined to um, repeat it. And I think it's a really important piece for our times. Actually, before you go, David, can I just interject? Um, the chat box should be closed, uh, but you can put your questions into the Q&A box. And if you have any um, technical difficulties, push, please drop a line in there. Toby Bray, our marketing director, is online to be able to support and respond. And also that the, a copy of the slide that will be um, distributed after the webinar. Great. Thank you, Ken. Sure. Thank you for reminding me as I rush through this. Um, so what you're saying is that it's important to really land on a definition of power that we can really operationalize and be able to reflect the struggle and the work of community organizations, community organizing around the country, and that we wanted to provide one that is really, really straightforward and reflects what power really is. And so we're going to be talking about power in terms of the definition of community power. Community power is the ability to get what is collectively desired from larger institutions and systems. It is the extent that a community has self-determination. Very clear. It's can you get what you want and what you work on getting? Um, and that's the basis. And again, like I said, we looked across different cultures, different languages, and that common theme keeps on coming out up. And I think it's really important to have that clarity. So our first discussion question and sharing with Celeste is, is it, is it part of the process? We find this a lot with our with our our clients, with foundations especially, where they have an internal debate: is community power an outcome? Is it a process? And often get caught up in that. What's your thoughts? I would definitely say that um, it is both. It's both a process and an outcome, and really, I think sometimes the the vantage point of many different. Um, especially foundations, is thinking that community power is solely an outcome. And the missed opportunity then is considering the process of what it takes in order to attain this type of self-determination, right, for an organized group of people around not just like a set of issues, but also maybe a long-term strategic vision of what they hope to see in their community, in their city, in their state. And so it's a both and um, absolutely. And I think with that, it's also an investment, right? When we look at um, and consider what a process is, that means that we need to invest time. We need to invest resources. We need to take risks in supporting um, innovative ideas and how to attain the outcome that we're striving towards. And sometimes um, because the outcome outweighs the process in, in different ways, um, vantage points on how to attain community power, what we lose um, then is really more innovation in our progressive efforts and how to establish equity um, in community, but also in our broader movement. Um, so um, I would absolutely say that it is a both and. Great, thank you so much. And I really like the point um, that it's both in terms of measurement and most importantly, an investment that it, you can't have that. And that, that's one of those false dichotomies that kind of trip us up and keep us from acting or used to keep us from acting on things. So thank you for that. So now, Ken. Yeah, thank you. So I think that's a great segue to the next few sets of slides. Um, and, and this is important to bring up because often we talk about power and equity as if they're two completely separate concepts, but they're really interrelated. And in this webinar, we're really trying to show how they're connected. Um, community science has a definition of equity, and this is what it says for very important components. It's fair access to resources and opportunities, um, the capacity to take advantage of these resources and opportunities, the rights to these resources and opportunities, and the freedom to obtain them without discrimination as respected by institutions and the law. So now we're going to move to evaluation, learning, and continuous improvement, because what we're trying to do is now connect power to equity to evaluation, learning, and continuous improvement. If there is anything constant in equity work and in power building work, it's actually change. And I think Celeste said something really important, innovation. 
How do you know you're innovating? How do you know what you're innovating is actually having an impact? Which is why evaluation is really important to build into the power building strategy from the start and not after the fact. Um, and then learning must be really in, intentionally built into the process. And, you know, David's throughout work in the years have really helped me understand there are two kinds of lessons we really have to think about. We always talk about lessons generated by the evaluation. What are the lessons learned from the evaluation findings and the insights we have? But there's another kind of learning that's really important, which is what do we know now that's needed in order for us to be successful? It's a slightly different set of lessons from lessons that are generated by the evaluation. And often we don't even think of the second type of learning because that sets us up to be successful. And lastly, an accountability structure that's really important. I think that you know, evaluators and others can you know, develop and have all kinds of insights and lessons and everything, but if leadership there's no accountability structure for them to use that learning and those insights, then it will just all go to waste. Um, so then talking about, you know, now marrying it with a systems lens. So now we've talked power, equity, evaluation, learning, and continuous improvement, and systems, because ultimately we're looking for these systems changes. And this tree is the, what rep represents very quickly the idea that you want to drive down into the root causes. So the leaves on top are what you see are the symptoms of the disparities. But if you drive down to the roots, you're looking at those patterns and trends that link these kinds of disparities because they're not one type of disparities, but they're all interconnected. And then the systems and the organized entities actually hold these kinds of patterns and trends together, which means what's the system that holds these things together? And then the mental models and narratives that are really baked into people's framing. And if you're a decision maker, bake into your decisions and that group thing concept um, that comes up when suddenly this is the decision we make because that's the narrative we've all accepted. Now, if we put it all together, it's the idea that you're building power from day one when you start to recognize the symptoms are in place and there's you're driving down to the root causes. You're building power in each of these stages of the work. And every time you build power, you're making progress towards equity. And in order to know if you're doing this, you then have to make sure that you're evaluating, you're learning, and you're improving the strategy throughout this whole process as you're diving into the root causes so that ultimately, when you're attacking the root causes and improving those conditions, you're creating and supporting healthy, just, and equitable communities. So when all of this comes together, I guess, Celeste, my question to you is that why are evaluation and learning so critical for continuously improving a community power building strategy? Yeah, absolutely. I would say, um, you know, as we consider like the, the cycle uh, almost like around the tree, it helps us to go deeper and deeper each time. And um, one, like when it comes to grassroots community efforts, especially around organizing to build collective power, meaning again, that they want to have self-determination around a set of issues or something in particular in their community. This then means that we need to assess what was the effectiveness and how we were able to accomplish our goal or set out to create a pathway that is maybe a policy reform or working through um, election cycles, or maybe it's actually just advocating for a new resource to exist within your community. At the end, um, I feel like oftentimes what is missed in uh, so much campaign work or community organizing efforts is skipping, right? Like, what did we learn from this process and experience? And um, what happens then is that um, strategy isn't able to be refined and isn't able to actually go deeper towards the root. We maybe spend more time spinning our wheels around the leaves, if you will, right? <laughs> um, and so um, I think that it's absolutely necessary and there's ways that um, external evaluation can also be helpful when it really emphasizes what is the collective learning, what's the wisdom, how are the insights gonna support an organization or a coalition to again, like refine their strategy rather than maybe just trying to um, measure one particular thing, one particular outcome. So it, it needs to be in concert with each other, right? Um, in order for us to, to have more effective movement towards those root causes. 
Um, but it's absolutely, it's absolutely fundamental. Um, and so hopefully on all sides, we see the value in that. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely true. Um, and I think now we're going to turn to now focusing on power completely. And so I'm going to turn it back to David. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Celeste, for that. Because reflection is really a, an important part of this process. Um, so just to start out, um, to talk about where the sources of power, often people, we realize that people um, and money uh, are among those sources of power, um, as well as relationships and um, who you know is always important, as well as information. Now, it's kind of a funny thing in the process here. We made this a multi-generational uh, symbolic uh, slide because you have both the modern symbol of power now for most of us and for those of us who are more dated, uh, a more traditional view of it. But what's at the core is the idea that people, money, and relationships and information all come together um, to be able to be sources of power. And in community organizing, most importantly, in community power building, it's people, relationships, and information that they have. The money is really critical. Others in our society leverage their money to be able to get information and relationships and sometimes pay for people, too, to show up. So that's an important concept as we begin to look at um, where does this power come from, ultimately, and what is the, the prize? Okay. Now, there are different types of power that we'll be exploring in this. Um, one is, and many are familiar with different types of ladders. We don't feel that there's a ladder appropriate for this, that a gradation. There's a point where the community has control, and that's what we're really focusing on. It has really power in it, rather than just having input. And so community control are those efforts where the community is represented by their leadership, and they make the, the strategic, the important decisions. There's also shared power. When you have that power and it's recognized by others that community leaders are at the table and that they have authentic engagement and equivalent decision-making power over whatever groups there are in these coalitions. For years, we sure, sure um, you know, shared impact, impact models of different type, collective impact models and others, which had everybody at the table of which the community leaders who really represent the aspirations and needs of their, of their members were just among the minority of members. So shared powers really comes down to who has both, who has say, rather than who's just sitting and getting input. And the third piece of it that we found is, and as growing understanding is the representation and relationships. Because getting people for the first time from the community represented in positions of power that they never had before, whether it be a school board or city council or commissions, as well as new and healthy relationships with those more powerful institutions all come together to, to the point where communities really have and can exercise their power. Thank you. There's a clarification question from the previous slide, David or Celeste. Um, someone asked, what's the difference between people and relationships? And is people power embedded in identities? <clears throat> um, well, I'm happy to take a stab at it, but David, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, no. Go ahead. yeah, I would say that when we're talking about power, there's like different um, expressions of power that we commonly interact with. And part of the definitions, right, that David just walked us through is really how are we working towards shared power? How are we working towards that collective um, effort of power? But in the day to day and how we interact with power, um, which is actually a neutral thing and it can be wielded in many different ways what we interact with is oftentimes dominant power meaning that there is um assertion right of like how people are leveraging their decision making their positionality their resources to influence others or even to control others and so at least to me when i see kind of the splitting of hairs if you will between people and relationships i think about who are decision makers um, in our communities. And not necessarily all decision makers are people that we elect. Um, we live in a, in a, you know, U.S. culture and many of us throughout the world where businesses are very influential decision makers on what will impact our communities, what will impact our daily lives. And those aren't people that have any accountability other than to their board, perhaps, um, or their bottom line. Um, so, while there's kind of that overlap between money and people, there are people, right, who are making decisions on behalf of others. But when we talk about, again, that shared power, collective power building that comes from community organizing, power there is in the relationship. The strength and 
the of our capacity to create change and to um, move forward in action is really contingent on um, how many relationships do we have? And then how are these relationships collectively coming together to negotiate with our decision makers or to propose changes and reforms that we need, um, right? Um, so that's kind of how I think about the two and the, and the ways that they overlap, but um, not every person individually um, has the same influential power um, in their community, right? And so how do we just acknowledge the different positionalities that people have in this conversation? Thank you, Sosa. And I would just quickly add to that, that in basic terms to sum it up, is that it really comes down to people part of the numbers. When you have a thousand people, a hundred people showing up, it's different than one. So it's really that kind of very direct part of it is that the power is there by the fact that you have the voice of the people and you represent many people and you can turn out. So am I, um, my training as an organizer in IAF, it was always just how many, how many, how many, which a turnout. I think it's also built to the point where we also understand this, let's say, relationships with powerful institutions that communities that have been historically disenfranchised don't have access to business power, doesn't have the governmental power, and that's the important. And finally, to David, the question that just popped up. You're right. It's not about the evaluators. It's about getting information. It's, it's, not, it's not that people need evaluators. People need information on their terms that they can use. And that's what we're trying to say. So evaluators, if we can do that, we're going to be helpful. If we're into other stuff, it's not going to work. So thank you for that question. And thank you, Celeste. Mm -hmm. um, so the three key components of the pathway to power that we're going to build off of. One is around community organizing, the ability to develop leadership and organization, to strengthen capacity, develop strategies, and to be able to take action. Once you have that ability and you have the structure and the leadership in place, then there's taking action based on a strategy that can lead to institutional, systemic, and environmental changes that result in building your power or more power. And finally, there's, or I don't know if finally is the right word, but the next component is having power. And that is what we're going to talk about more, the ability to influence decisions, to make things happen that you work on happen. Okay. So everyone is familiar with the theory of change, the logic model, and here's our, our attempt to kind of give a more generic model, because often the work that we do comes from a funding and intermediary. And really, there's the operating support we found to really help organizations be able to not have, the, that, this is not a program, this is a lifelong thing, and just a, a three-year, two-year grant. It's really helping to institutionalize the resources and capacity and the connections to be able to continue this work because it is an ongoing uh, process. Next click. That means that the capacity has to be developed. And we just gave a list of some of them we found most important, but that grassroots capacity needs to be developed as part of that, okay? And several things, whether it's how to manage resources, how to begin to organize, developing their leadership, uh, a structure, uh, how to have community-driven decision-making and democratic processes ahead, as well as how to address conflict. Um, these and other capacities are really important through the funding mechanisms and through the support that are provided to these efforts that lead to um, uh, organizing activities uh, such as these, mobilizing um, and cultivating effective community leadership, taking action, really thoughtful, effective strategies, and then finally having power, really seeing those changes in institutions and in systems that they have been working towards. Um, all this happens within the context of culture, history, geography, demographics, and power differences. Now the fun part comes. This is always part for all those years of presenting evaluation. This is where it really gets live. We talk about indicators and measures. Um, and I, we want to start a little out of order because we often get to this as the end, and this is really keeping the eye on the prize. What are we trying to achieve here? And so you'll see we have kind of moved through that pathway on the right. But we want to start here is that first, having power is achieving the changes in organizations that reflect the priorities and aspirations of community members in their community. If they are working on it and they get what they want, they have power. Okay, there's power here collectively. And how that's developed, we'll talk about, but that's really critical. Ways to look at that are goal attainment, the technique that's available out there. And we can't go through everything. This is just an hour and less than shortening 
Evan. So we're just going to touch on some key components here. Um, so what I'm going to, so you'll get this afterwards. You can see some of this and there's surely probably more as examples, but I wanted to just ask Celeste what jumps out from her on this list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that <clears throat> perception of institutions with power that community-led organizations are essential to engage when working in their communities and effective at making change is actually um, one of the ways that you can really measure like how strong does this coalition of organizations or does this campaign or does this right like community organization um, have power? Um, and when I really think about this, I think about um, are like are these community organizations and their leaders being consulted on decisions that will impact their community? Like being able to step into that role and to know that there is value in people's lived experience, that is also a strong measure of power. An example that comes to mind of an organization that I've interacted with quite a bit over the years is Isaiah, for example, in Minnesota. Um, they have really established a strong amount of power building in the state of Minnesota, both through policy advocacy, um, but also um, through political action. And oftentimes there are entities that absolutely have to consult their organization, whether they would like to or not, because the constituency and their membership is so strong and in um, unity as far as the vision of what they want for a greater um, collective good in Minnesota. And so I think again, uh, but how they achieved that was a long-term investment um, in their organization, supporting the capacity building um, of their leadership base, encouraging of recruitment in a variety of styles um, so they could attain that wide reach, not just in the city centers of Minnesota, but also throughout rural Minnesota. And so there, there are things I think that we need to consider um, as far as that measure that this is really not insignificant, but a lot of organizations and coalitions are not able to get there because there isn't necessarily that ongoing investment in the process of them attaining this level of power building. Um, but at the end, we really want to be negotiators. That's part of how power works um, and how it is wielded is the ways that it is negotiated around, right? And when, especially when it comes to decision making. Great, thank you. I think a big point is again is that it's like if you, you have to be seen as a player, you have to be you, your power has to be appreciated or feared to, uh, to be or at least reckoned with and recognized, and that takes building that base. And you have to be able as an indicator to show that what you worked on, you got the changes or at least some of the changes that you were looking to the degree of that. Really important. Without that. You don't have sufficient power to, you know, to be able to make change. And that's really what the goal. Do you have the power to have get what you want out of the systems and institutions that serve your community? Yeah. Yeah. And so the next slide talks about indicators of community organizing. Right? As we move through this pathway of change on the right, we're now moving to the immediate outcomes, if you want to think of that, the mobilization and formation part. Um, and so I think parts of all of these are indicators. I'm sure there are more, but um, and we can talk through them. But I'm going to ask again Celeste to start us with the one that's most significant to her that she sees we often don't give enough attention to. Or, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I would say this bullet here around conducting community outreach and recruitment activities um, is actually an area that sometimes is missed as an opportunity for um, more strategic investment or encouragement of innovative strategies and how to recruit community members to be a part of a community organization, a campaign, or a coalition. Um, we live in a time, right, where we just collectively moved through a pandemic the past three years. And what we've seen as part of the innovation in our uh, community organizing sphere is that there's more efforts for digital organizing. And now there are more trainings that are becoming accessible as organizations are now interacting again more so in person, but we're seen as a hybrid of engagement of organizations um, and how they're trying to recruit people as well as continually maintain them to be a part of the power building of their organization. And if we had not gone through this collective experience uh, around the pandemic for COVID-19, I'm not sure if there would have been the same kind of strategic investment 
in digital organizing, even though we live in such a digital world. And I think what that reflects to me is that sometimes we get very rigid in the ways that we see how recruitment activities should be. Um, we are just determined that, okay, door knocking is the best method or going to an institution and attending a faith service or a parent to um, student teacher meeting is like the best way to recruit community leaders. And while those have proven to be effective, at this time, we need to be more encouraging of what other strategies are possible, what kind of hybrid um, engagement might be possible, and understand that this front investment is absolutely crucial for the effectiveness for the outcome of having power. If we're not encouraging folks to actually meet new people, for organizers to really refine their skills for recruitment um, to effectively build a team, then we're not going to get to the desired outcome of communities having power or being able to take action on the issues that are most crucial to them. Um, so um, I would just definitely say here that it really stands out to me as an area that could be a growing edge, right? And in this conversation, um, as well as as a priority when we think about investing in the long-term process of power building. Thanks, Celeste. I totally agree. And I'm looking at a question in the chat too about how, how are we capturing the expansion of digital organizing? Um, I just remember an instant in our work where there was a, a mother um, who a monolingual Spanish speaking mother who actually what she did was created a, a, on, in her WhatsApp basically a network of parents. Oh, I think there might have been over a hundred of her parents and she could easily in that button just mobilize all of these parents to show up at a meeting. Um, and so that was pretty powerful to me as one way to do it was just through that and they could connect you know, all of these parents together. The other thing I wanted to bring up is the number and diversity of community member turnout for community actions. I mean, there's digital organizing, then there's people turning up in places. Um, you know, we, we've done evaluations where we've definitely seen people saying like, this is the first time we are showing up at school board meetings, right? And maybe because before they didn't have interpretation assistance or any other kind of support. And now that there is like, you're getting this huge turnout and it's the first time um, you know, in Austin, I remember when community members showed up in front of the um, city um, town hall at a city council meeting about law enforcement tactics, and you got all these people out there showing up, and that's an indicator of the fact that you've mobilized people to show up. Um, I think there's a question in the, the chat a little bit about um, capacity building versus capacity sharing, um, the, the leaning on the expertise of local community organizations um, to inform some of these strategies. I don't know if the two of you have any comments on that. If I can just just touch on what you just said before to go to that and I'm glad, yeah, I think there's two points. One is that I'm glad you mentioned first time events. I was not, because that's really critical to measure and I didn't know where exactly it fit in here, but I think it's really important for evaluators to know, especially those first time events are really important. The other thing to look at is measuring is that, and we may be able to share a guide that we've done around this, but it's really looking at Facebook and media. There are metrics available to see outreach over time in terms of hits and um, other aspects. So that is available. Uh, and it's pretty accessible uh, from both Twitter and from uh, Facebook and other forms to be able to get those metrics and be able to chart that out with relative ease to that. So that's what I need to say um, about it. I think that at least to, to pick on the capacity building side, I think it's both the f really understanding that it's driven an adult learning approach to this and a peer learning approach is really important. Um, adult learning is that it may not be that all the expertise does reside in the community. And so you need that expert expertise. And sometimes as a, it's very hard to be able to balance being prescriptive and reactive, but given the pace of things and with the experience that is out there, we can anticipate sometimes things that community groups will need when they're mobilizing for the first time and give them the power to choose if they want it and how they want to do it. But it's offering them that buffet first, so that uh, first of options for them saying, we've seen this work elsewhere. And then it's also important to be able to learn from each other. That's really where it comes from. Other groups is really important, not only for power building, but also for capacity building. So I'll pass on Celeste. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, would, I think the other thing that I would just mention to this piece around capacity building and capacity sharing is 
um, part of like who like should be consulted is not just the executive director or organizers of the community organization, but the how we know that we have attained power is that it is directly the membership of that those organizations who are being consulted, right? And I think going back to that example of looking towards Isaiah, it's not folks just calling up Doran, the executive director, and being like, oh, you know, what's Isaiah's position on this policy? It's actually being like, you know, what is your membership saying, right? Um, so I think, again, when we, for community organizations that might be on this call, that is also an internal measure for yourself. And that's part of the value of why reflection and evaluation should be core to grassroots organizing strategies overall, because again, it helps us to refine and understand how effective we are being in the field, um, right? And not just depending on external evaluators from a foundation to potentially partner with us to consider these questions. These should be ongoing to really the health and strength of um, how you're leaning into relationship um, power building in that collective power building. Thank you. There are a few questions in the chat that I'm actually going to, but I'm going to move us along. Um, and hopefully some of these questions will be answered at the end, because I know we still have a few slides to go. Um, um, can, can I just raise one question? Sure. I just want to say, emphasize one thing in Celeste's point, which is, because it has to do with the communication channel point, this communication channel, is that you have to first learn how people do it on their own and what they what they know what their, their natural or their own processes are and build upon that. Um, it's not like they go to executive leadership and I've seen so many community leadership things that are run like somebody just copied something from business or go with the assumptions of how adults learn or how people with that community learn. And for a lot, they're you know so that's really important to first learn how people learn, learn how people communicate with each other. And that's the solution to a lot of these problems that Celeste they pointed out. Actually, David, what you said is a great segue for this slide, right? We're talking okay, about good, right. community leadership here, right? And engage allies and champions, two very important parts of community organizing. Um, I think Celeste, you, you wanna talk a little bit about this facilitating consensus building, inclusiveness, conflict transformation, which is part of this work and a natural part of this work. And yet we don't seem to pay enough attention to it. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, really like when we think about um, community leadership, well, first, like as a community organizer, and especially when this was my work um, on the ground, um, part of my responsibility was to first reach out to people and to bring people together that um, cared about similar issues, right? Um, and in that, the, the goal was to build a team of community leaders. So what does that like mean in practice? It means having the space to actually really see what are the natural gifts and talents of the people around me? What is the potential of their leadership style growing to be more confident and more continually expressed? And so like a common way to actually support leadership development of uh, a newer community member, right? As a part of your team, could be facilitating a meeting, right? Um, and part, why would you do that, right? There's lots of different reasons why you would do that. But uh, one of the main reasons is for that person to see themselves in a position of leadership where they're exercising their voice, where they're able to manage a group of people in a conversation. Not everybody is actually invited to do that in their day-to-day -day life. Some of us do because that's part of our work and our profession, but the majority of folks actually don't have those day-to-day -day experiences. And so being able to move through that is really important. Again, giving your community leaders feedback on how they're showing up, right? And how their identities, um, their social identities are showing up within a space. For folks to be willing to learn, oh, as a white leader in a team of undocumented immigrants and receiving feedback about how much I'm verbally participating or the ways that I may be shooting down people's ideas, talking about those power dynamics and as the organizer offering that feedback to my community leaders in the past is really important to understand, um, right? Like the effectiveness of how I'm developing my team. Um, there's a question here in the Q&A as far as like organization, is there examples of organizing with like outside of nonprofits or physically sponsored projects? Absolutely, there's a ton of examples. Those aren't necessarily things that are always captured, um, but 
Um, many times that's actually where we're learning some of the greatest strategies on how to move through conflict transformation, how to pursue um, you know, more methods of democratic decision-making is through grassroots efforts that are more or less formalized, you know, in an institutional way, but um, can really give us insight on how to better inform our organizations. And I think the other piece I would say here um, is that um, for community leaders to self-facilitate consensus building or working through conflict with one another and making democratic decisions, that is also a measure, right, of how effective your team or your organization is wielding their collective power. Um, and so, again, I would just say, like, these measurements as far as leadership development and these types of milestones are really important, and it takes time. It takes time for that community leader to facilitate that very first conversation and their community team to then be able to um, at a public action, share their story or facilitate part of an agenda with decision makers present, right? Or to sit down and have a negotiation conversation with people who are, again, have positional power um, that are influencing perhaps the, the areas of issues that they're really passionate about. And it's not just that one person, right? But it's the collective of your team, it's the collective of your organization and how each person feels like they have the skills to step into these various roles of leadership and feel valued for the different expressions, styles, talents that they have as leaders. Yeah, and I, I want to just build on that point a little bit from an evaluation perspective that takes time to really collect that kind of qualitative data to really understand how someone goes from, I just, you know, facilitated the first meeting to now I show up at the, you know, town council meeting to now I've organized more people to bring with me to these meetings and actually asserted what we need, our priorities. And it's really understanding that process which has a lot with that qualitative data and capturing it. And we'll mention a little bit about the kind of methodology. I also wanna talk about this other point. I think, you know, Celeste, building on what you talked about, consensus building, conflict transformation, is also this part about engaging allies and champions that it's not as, you know, we, we think of like, okay, you work with other organizations and institutions with common interests. So your measure is like, how many number of these organizations, institutions are in your network? But it's never that easy because when we bring organizations together, even though they all look like they share the common interest, there's going to be tension, there's going to be conflict for all kinds of reasons. And so you see the numbers go up in terms of the number of groups, but you can see the number go down. And there's a story to be told there that we have to capture as well, because number going up, number going down doesn't always mean it's good or bad, but there's a story behind it. And and and. You know, so often what we see our funders say, you all share the same common interests, sit down and talk to each other and work together. Well, you know, I always say it's taken us how many generations to create divides between people and between organizations. It's not going to happen overnight for people to start collaborating. Thank you. I, and getting my two cents in on this is that um, I wanted to first emphasize that um, and, and, it's, and appreciate what's been said. The, um, just on that term, organize, it's all about terms, right? In a lot of ways. And so that organization I want to build on, just to clarify, we're using organization here. We're not talking about nonprofits or higher structures. It's me organizing is a process of organizing, creating organization in a community that is effective in exercising or having power. So there is an organizational structure, but I don't want to think that, that we're talking about like, you know, your normal nonprofit. The second words that I want to be able to, clarify and something that was ingrained in me as a, as an organizer was the difference between leaders uh, organizers advocates advocates activists and members okay that is like among the worst practices um, in uh, philanthropy and evaluation is that not seeing the distinctions between them now in under resourced um, communities like rural areas, sometimes they blend together. This is not rigid, but we have to be able to develop a more effective language and understanding. Leaders have members. They are constituents that they are accountable to. Leadership is a collective notion. That's the whole process. Leaders are individuals who have that relationship that re reflect the aspirations and needs accountability. Organizers are basically like staff. They, they're, they're servant leaders are sometimes 
they're, they're referred to. They're making things happen behind the scenes. Advocates are often those high level, you know, um, you know, and these are somewhat interchangeable, but advocates are usually those statewide, those large organizations that come in at that higher level to advocate for specific policies, uh, policies and practices. They're not necessarily accountable to the community. And again, it gets blurry lines along with activists, sometimes known as flamethrowers and, and less things. But these are the people who often you they get confused with leaders. They're the people who come to every meeting, shout, leak, or every meeting and talk, but they don't have necessarily a constituency. Okay. They're not really accountable. They're the people who often get grabbed because a funder or an evaluator likes what they have to say because they're always outspoken, but we don't really check to see, do they have a relationship with members? Can they really deliver the numbers of people um, that are needed to make change? And members are your rank and file, your people. And as, as Celeste very eloquently said, there's a developmental process that takes time, as Ken pointed out. But I think it's really important as a field that we begin to make better distinctions, even though there's some blurry lines, don't get, don't get trampled by that. Just understanding that that's strategically, these are strategically important terms that we have to use a lot better. So. Absolutely. I think can just to, to summarize what David said and like an organizing principle I learned, um, and that has continued to help me, organizers train leaders, leaders organize, leaders have a following, right? Activists are people who are passionate about an issue and will show up for that, but that does not guarantee that they're having an investment in their leadership to be developed. And um, ultimately, a, a huge measure of having power is when your leaders become organizers, right? And start training others on how to be community leaders. That's ultimately the goal, right? Of like what we should hope to attain and all levels of engagement are really important because it is part of the arc of a leadership journey, right? And again, goes back to why it's important to invest in the process. Thank, Thank you. you. That's great. I'm going to move us along here. Um, I know we only have a few more minutes, but the last form here is about growth of individual power and well-being through organizing. Um, I'm going to move us along because I think the next slide is just important, but what we want to point out here is that inclusive practices for leadership development and succession and self-care are very important aspects of this work that I think both Celeste and David really have been talking about just now differentiating those categories of stakeholders and what we need and that developmental process. So the next slide is around taking action as another form of, as another part of the pathway. And David, I'm gonna turn this to you. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I think that I just like to highlight that it's all about the action in that way. That is the exercise of that power. Everything that's been coming up to this point leads to a community having power. And it starts, I would just highlight that well-planned and informed strategy means to me, and, and these are all measurable, um, is that do they use those four sources of power? How do they use those four sources of power to be able to leverage change? People, money, relationships, and information. All of that comes together to be able to, um, of a series of actions, Plural is really important, doesn't happen at one time, and being able to track that story of how that process goes on. Um, uh, engaging in effective actions means that there's, there's a number of people who, who get involved and assert their voice and priorities. And part that we want to introduce that often gets uh, kind of put to the end is controlling the narrative. Because so much of power has to do with who controls the narrative, the story, how the community is depicted in general, how the community is depicted in this process. Is it seen in positive light? And who gets that? So that public relations, that media orientation, that controls the narrative becomes a very important part of it. Again, there are ways to be able to look at that. Um, Celeste, what are your thoughts? What pops out to you? I think... <clears throat> um... Here, you know, like being able to me measure effective strategies is also really crucial when it comes to taking action. Um, and it, you can have a strategy, but it might not be the best one. And that kind of goes back to our earlier part of the conversation as to why reflection and self-evaluation for a community organization is so important um, in 
continually getting to those root causes of things, right? How am I refining the strategy? Do I see a long-term vision of how we can win? And what does it mean if we lose? But when I lose, am I losing in a way where I lose forward? What I mean is, for example, um, one of the campaigns that I worked on here in Colorado was around um, increasing access for driver's licenses to undocumented immigrants here in our state. There already existed a law in 2013 that was passed, but the way that the law was written actually created many barriers that didn't allow for folks with a temporary status such as DACA and other visas to attain a license um, because of social security numbers. It didn't allow um, for a whole population of, of other people to access. There was also a limited amount of resources at the state um, that limited the number of offices that could um, offer appointments. All of this to say, we knew that in order to achieve what community wanted across the state. One, we had to build an effective base and we did so by um, gathering together over 60 community organizations. And we couldn't just rely on our community organizations to implement changes and to advocate for what they needed across the state of Colorado. We also had to find more and more partners that could help us move forward the mark of our strategy and what we wanted to attain. So we considered the different possibilities of Okay, we're gonna have a very public campaign our first year because we wanna increase awareness. Okay, year two, we're gonna still have a public campaign and we're gonna focus on one bill instead of maybe five um, different policies that could happen. That came from us reflecting on what could we win, right? Even though we still had our platform and agenda of everything that we needed to attain to win. And that, um, in pursuing that refinement of our strategy helped us to identify who else were the other people, the decision makers that had influence around this issue. And it led to a lot of non-conventional partners um, that otherwise maybe would not have um, come to our coalition and been strategically aligned with us to win. Um, and so again, it helps us to um, think forward and to see that these incremental steps as part of the process, um, ultimately do help us to achieve, yes, the outcome and the goal. And it should help us also reflect as a community organizer or community organization on how am I effectively supporting my membership and their leadership development along the way, right? Right. Um, yeah, and I think what you're saying is really speaks to the first bullet about like just having clear goals and then clear targets, right? And who do you bring on? Um, and that it's about those wins that are incremental along the way, because otherwise you know, it can be overwhelming. Right. So, yeah, at the end Thank of the goodness. day, David, what we're striving for. What are we running for? I just want to, of course, get my one piece on that to emphasize that back to the earlier question that everything that Celeste said Evaluate, the appropriate evaluator who's respectful and understanding and responsive to the process, we have the tools to help with some of that information and knowledge in terms of power analysis, of other ways to assist and be more facilitative. I want to bring it back and can provide that data if we know how to facilitate that kind of discussion and understanding of how to use it in a way that people will understand and be able to apply it. So I just want to say that that was a great depiction. And everywhere I could check, there are things that we can help community organiz organizing efforts do um, if we do it right. So bringing it all together now, I want to say that it's very simple that we, we see that the point has been community systems change is a, po a power building process that leads to having power. And having power means that communities have the ability to get what it collectively, what they collectively demand from larger institutions and systems. Now, the question has come up earlier in, in your registration questions, which I appreciate those who put them down because hopefully we've um, incorporated a lot of them, is that what methodology? Well, I'll give you criteria first. One is that it has to tell a story. It's this is just, it is a story here of a process not only and in a lot of good reasons, including that a story allows us to account for differing contexts, including history, cultures, conflicts, power, analysis, et cetera. Really critical. It captures the actual changes in systems and, and communities, not just individuals. It's really being having an eye on the prize that it's systems, policies, and practices, and how they allocate resources. That is what we're trying to change. 
that it recognizes that there can be different approaches to power building. While I would argue that there's a clear definition that everything comes together, there are many ways to get there and be able to see that there's not one just model of it, as long as we have the same eye on the prize and some of those earlier factors really play into it. Who's involved, how they wanna be involved and in their past experience and culture and history um, really matter. Um, and that incorporates this, that kind of, it's not a qualitative, a lot of questions of is it qualitative or quantitative, it's both, it's a story, okay, and that's why it does, is what's available and what's meaningful and what really tells it the right way. Our recommendation, um, as we continue to make, is that the best methodology is the cross-case study methodology, where each community, which enables you to do these things, and we have a citation here where you can learn more about that. It's the, we're building off of the uh, Robert Yin and Robert Stakes work. Um, and we've kind of now put a systems lens to it. Uh, so I, I, I would say that's a good start for the methodological, but it really is kind of being able to say that something that can provide the rigor of understanding what's going on with the ability to appreciate, to tell a story that appreciates culture and context and diversity in its, in its best forms. Thank you. Um, I think that that's kind of the end and we have about four minutes left. So I want to pick one question here that someone asked. Um, what defines an engaged base and how do you measure an engaged base? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I can raise my hand. Okay. <laughs> I, I think it goes back to some of the points. I think that it's a multi, obviously it's multidimensional. It has to do with numbers and how you're involved. And I think as Ken said, uh, and so let's say it's a developmental process, developmental not only in the sense of first time events, but for the individuals as a community and indiv the, the individual and community power dynamic is, is a growing one. They work together hand in hand, okay? Um, so much research shows that they go collective efficacy, which is so powerful, comes from individual efficacy and individual efficacy contributes to collective efficacy. So that process really helps as people begin to um, start out meeting, you know, how many people, first time events, new members, increasing numbers, increasing roles, increasing knowledge about how systems change, um, you know, among the rank and file. Again, all this is resource dependent on how much you can ask, but it's really, have you been involved before? Why are you involved now? And how involved are you over time? Um, and we begin to see that in this most basic form. Yes, and I would say engagement can be at like several different levels, which again, like the community organization should refine what their membership model is. Um, just pulling what your email list is, that is not a good measure of what an engaged base is. However, right, you may have um, people who are monthly sustainable donors and that does influence your membership model. Okay, how many of those people who are contributing to your organization monthly are also in those levels of engagement that David described as far as roles within the organization, participating in um, team like campaign meetings um, or you know other activities within the organization. So um, engagement needs to be clearly defined as it relates to the community organization's membership model. Um, and supporting a community organization to gain that clarity with resources or pushing them to answer that question, I would say is also very, very important um, because that clarity is important to then get to the outcome, right? Of how um, power can be attained. And if I can, again, add just one more time, <laughs> my last slide, just adding, is that um, it's a diversity of the base also. I think one of the things we haven't had chance to touch on is the, the generational clashes that are going on in many communities where the base is the old guard often and the young younger people don't see a place and that may not be how they operate. There are other diversities. So it's not only the numbers that sense, but the diversity of people who have not been included even within that community for a number of reasons. That's a great point. Thank you for sharing that. We are at time. And so um, thank you for all those wonderful questions. And I just want to thank the audience for being with us today and hanging in there with us on such an important topic. Thank you, Celeste. Thank you, David. And thank you, Toby, for your behind the scenes help. Great. Absolutely. Thank Thanks for having me. Sure. And you will all get the slide deck after the webinar. Thank you and have a wonderful day or evening, everybody.